So I will say right off the bat, anybody who knew me from like the age of 12 would not have thought that I would be a single mother. This is Aisha, the other half of Mocha SMC. I was a rules girl. I was a rules follower. I had a vision of a correct order of doing things in um, an equally yoked right situation, right? Quote, unquote, right situation. And so I set off to do that. And so I met a wonderful guy, individual in college, and we dated for our entire college career, my entire college career. So in told we had an 11 year relationship. And so when it, when we graduated, you know, the next natural thing was to get married. And so it was not as smooth as that. There were lots of theoretical conversations about how we envision ourselves marrying, how we envisioned our life as parents. And he would just say things like random crazy things about, you know, him having total control and, you know, the kids being raised a certain way. And I'm just like, yeah. So, you know, we would, we would kind of butt heads on that, but we kind of pushed through because we loved each other and we thought, at least I thought that, you know, love would conquer all and that, you know, we would meld together and become this unit that, you know, rolls out these great little people into the world. And that did not happen. I say that to say that it was not all on him, that there were, there was a part of me that was just like, oh, he doesn't really mean that, you know, no matter how crazy it is, that was how he envisioned his life. That was not how I envisioned my life. And I never fully was sold on it, but I loved him and I wanted to be with him. You know, I love him, right? (laughs) So in spite of their differences, they got married. It took some time for the issue of kids to be brought to the surface because they were young and taking advantage of their youth. But then I started getting the itch, you know, Mm -hmm. I was living in a slower paced city and I was just like, yeah, okay, I'm ready. I want to have kids. And he's just like, no, remember that, that whole total control thing? I really meant it. And so we spent probably a year pushing and pulling on total control. And like, what does that mean? And he meant total control with me as the worker bee. And so the gap between me wanting to have kids and us continuing to have this conversation, I kept progressing in my career. I went to grad school and I graduated. And so I I knew what my career path was. And so by not having kids, that freed me up to say, okay, I want to explore these career opportunities. And so I landed a job that took me away from Pennsylvania back to New York. And so we, we lived separate for probably a good year, was going on 18 months, where it was still, I want total control. You need to quit that job and come back. Um, but eventually I convinced him that the right move for us was to move together, um, and land in like central Pennsylvania. So, um, and so he did that, but he was bitter. He was bitter. He was hurt. He still didn't want to give me babies. He said, I I never intend to be the um, primary caregiver of a child. And so my job required travel. So he said, if you're going to be still traveling with this job, you need to take the kid with you or find childcare arrangements. And I was just like, whoa what is this? And so eventually I realized that the things I was asking him to do just were not things that sat right with him. And I have, I have always been a person to leave people as whole as I can leave them. So I loved him. This was not working for me, was never going to work for me. It was not working for him. So I made the decision to get a divorce. Married at 23, divorced at 29, and still without the children she wanted. Yet, Aisha remained hopeful and decided to try again. I had to start from scratch and, you know, find out who I was as a single woman because I had never been a single woman, right? I entered college at 18, 19. He was my everything through 29. Oh, my goodness. And (laughs) And so, anyway, long story short, got out there dating and... While his um, his uh, caveat was that he needed to have total control, everybody had requirements. I, uh, you know, I'm I'm not ready. I already have my kids. Um, I don't plan to be in this area long. So it was just things. And so eventually, I sat back and I was just like, you know, 
I might not be a mom. So this is like at 32 coming to this realization, I might not get a chance to be a mom because my time is running out and there is nothing out there in the dating world but pain right now for someone who wants to be a mom to be told, I already have my kids, so you you either stay with me or not. You know, so then I was just like, okay. So I started Google searching and I stumbled upon, you know, getting pregnant on your own. I had always known that there were like sperm banks out there. Um, and so I was Googling, I was in like um, some of the popular apps for um, people having babies and things like that. And so I was just like, how do I get started? And so they were just like, you know, you talk to an RE, which is, I was like, what's that? A reproductive endocrinologist. They were like, that's where you start. And so I began having the conversation with my, um, my G, my OBGYN and she was just like, yeah, great, go for it. You know, and I still couldn't do it because for someone who's so used to the rules, it's just like, okay, what are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know, my sisters had all had kids, you know, by the time they were like in their mid twenties. So I was the last one. And so I would be crying. I'm like, I want to have kids. And it's just like, well, why don't you adopt or you have everything? Why do you want this other thing? And you're crying about it. And so finally I cried um, to my um, foster mom, my stepmom. Um, I call her and I was just like, I want to have a baby. And I don't think I'm going to have a baby. And she was just like, why don't you just go out there and get some sperm and go get your baby? And I was just like, Okay. And so that is when the seed firmly took place. So you felt supported and I felt supported. And I think you needed that like women, women, sisterhood is so important because when I was going through my divorce, it was my, my big sister and my foster mom who was like, don't do that. Don't leave your job don't do these things wow. that my ex-husband was asking for out of love. Right. Mm. And so then, you know, my foster mom was a 60 something year old, deeply religious woman who had gone through a divorce, had four grown children. And so there's something about looking back and having perspective that I think, you know, is where her words came from. It's just like, you know, do this, because this is going to fulfill you, not the marriage, right? Having been divorced, me also being divorced, not the marriage, not anything else. If this is something you feel driven to, go ahead, do that. Go get yourself a baby. It's just that easy. And, you know, so to the extent you need that village of women to encourage you to see, to make the impossible possible, to help you get out of your way, you know, was invaluable. And even with that level of support, Aisha still had to deal with pushback in her community and family from men and women. I did get pushback from, from the men in my life, but I also got pushback, very subtle pushback when I was like, I was crying and I had a sibling say, oh, you have everything and you can't have this one thing. So you get that kind of pushback when you're at a very vulnerable point in your life. Like, oh, nobody wants you. You're unworthy. That's why you have no kids and you're barren. And, you know, if you want to have kids and you, you put it off and you've been, you know, taking pills. Um, and then when you want to have kids, you want to turn to God to give you kids. So I got that kind of pushback from women. Wow. So it was like a literal kick in the uterus, right? And it's yeah. just like, um, okay. But the way that I address that pettiness is the way I address an, un uh, an unplanned pregnancy that a friend had, is that those kids are going to be here. They're going to come, whether you like it or not, whether other people like it or not, that kid is going to thrive. That kid is going to be happy. That kid is going to run around. That kid is going to be all alive in your face, right? Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. that's, that's what new life does, right? That kid is going to cry. And if you're that person who was like, don't bring that kid into the world, you're the devil's spawn. You're the worst person in the world. The very presence of that kid will have you eating crow every day you see that child. So think real real hard about what you say about somebody's baby because right. the very success of their presence will make you die a little inside each time. Judgment from the sisterhood is painful, especially when you are in need of empathy, love, or at the very least grace just to figure it out. As for the men, Aisha experienced that pushback in a different way. It's a very 
pernicious type of pettiness. That's why I want you to talk about this. So, and these are, these are from guys who are good people, good, guys. good people, dating guys that I would date guys that I have dated. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it comes in the form of, no, why don't you just wait for, you know, for a man to come into your life? Why don't you just do it the right way? Meanwhile, you're 52 dating a 36 year old telling me to wait. Listen, when you have your grown kids and you want me to wait because it, but still date you while I wait, right? The, yeah. the, the cognitive dissonance there still date you while I'm supposed to be waiting for a partner to have a baby with. That's incredible. And, right. And so it's just like, you want all the things that comes with a single attractive woman with all of the free time and disposable income and nothing but attention to dote on you. Right. But when it comes down to the things that she wants, oh, you just don't want to give her a baby. And so it's just like, so it's that that type of response. And then also, oh, you know, I think that's great. It's so empowering. I mean, you're doing the thing, but don't you think that it's kind of, you know, um, breaking down the black family? And what do you say to that? How do you even respond to something like that? To be honest, you know, it just rolls off my tongue, you know, because I'm like, Well, that's a lot to put on black women, because what I actually think is destroying the black family is misogyny. Come on. Domestic violence. Hello. Infidelity. Mm -hmm. All types of emotional abuse, instability, financial instability. All of those things are breaking down the black family. My little self connecting a sperm with an egg inside my uterus, not going to make a difference. If I stay childless, not going to make a difference, right? So I am not going to overcome history. Me, myself, in my lifetime, not going to do it. But perhaps you keeping it in your pants Mm. or you keeping your hands to yourself or you loving Black women as partners might just change something. And one person can do that. Right. How was your experience of being pregnant by yourself? Like, so, what was that like? That's a good question because I think, remember we talked about the pettiness of people. Yeah. And you get it the most when you're most seen and you're most seen when you're taking up more space, right? When your belly is bigger, people start to notice not just that you don't wear earrings or something. They notice you don't have a ring on your finger, right? And so that is the most visible I had ever been seen by everybody. And Did you think you to know, put a ring on your, fa- um, on no, your finger? I was not going to do that because one, I had already been married I was already in my 30s. There was no need to have a pretense. This was the life that I was going to live and I'm going to live it out loud, Love you it. know, and, and that's not to say that I was not nervous, mm-hmm. but it is that I am going to live my life above all else. I'm going to live. Right. And so I was not going to, to fake the funk on that. One of the things I've learned from all of my friends who've experienced pregnancy is that every pregnancy is different. So I asked Aisha to describe her two pregnancies and boy, am I glad I did. They were literally night and day. Everything about the first pregnancy, trying to conceive with the first, everything was textbook and smooth. I got pregnant on the second IUI. I claimed that pregnancy from the time I got a positive pregnancy test. I told all the people. And the pregnancy was textbook. I ate whatever I wanted. It was, I did water, Zumba, Aqua Zumba, you know, (laughs) delivery was, um, she came at like 38 weeks, um, which is considered full term, but 40 weeks is what they wanted. Um, And, you know, when she was born, she was jaundiced. Now this is important because this is where my unexplained secondary infertility came from. She was born jaundice, heavily jaundice, because our blood types mixed in our systems. And so my body ended up attacking hers. So up until that point, it was textbook. And even after that, you know, that was a blip that Mm. happened, but the rest was textbook. And I thought, you know, I've got this amazing little baby. She was such an easy kid. And then when she turned one, I was like, all right, I'm going at it again. I can do do this again. again. I'm like, you know, and... 
life has a way of humbling you. Because I was just like, yeah, I'm going to do this again. It's going to be easy. And it was not. Not at all. Aisha decided to undergo IUI as she did for her first pregnancy. And just as before, the first treatment was unsuccessful. So she tried it again. Only this time, the second treatment was also unsuccessful in spite of using the same sperm. Her doctors assured her that with her good fertility numbers, IVF will be successful and they were right. She got four grade A embryos and pregnant on her first round. At about six or seven weeks, I claimed the pregnancy. I was telling people I was having nausea at work. I was just like, this is great. And then I miscarried. What? Mm -hmm. I miscarried at eight and a half weeks. And I was on the table and they were like, there's no heartbeat. Oh my goodness. So I miscarried and that just caused a catastrophic event. I had a two cycle package. I was like, I'm not doing it again. I'm not, I'm done with this. I can't do this, you know? Um, and then I did it again. Aisha began her second round of IVF and once again, got four grade A embryos. The result of the transfer, one didn't take and the other resulted in another early miscarriage she decided it was now time to change clinics. I found a clinic that was supposed to be one of the best on the East Coast. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go all in, I'm doing this. I'm going to spend two weeks at that location. I took two weeks vacation. I brought my daughter with me. I did the monitoring appointments. I did everything. And I got, was supposed to have like 14 follicles. They retrieved five. And then one was, um, they sent it for um, testing. It was abnormal. Nothing. That was a $21,000 cycle. Nothing. And so then I was just like, okay, something is clearly wrong. Having been in the SNC spaces, I knew that there was a such thing as donor egg. And donor egg was seen as almost a guarantee because they were young eggs from young donors. It took time for me to get to the point of being okay with donor eggs. And I had considered adoption. I had considered um, adopting it using one of my friend's leftover embryos. And I was like, oh, well, if I'm there, I'm already here. Right. So let me just go ahead and use donor eggs. And so still using my daughter's sperm, I was like, we're going to do this with donor egg. And so I got three embryos. It's just like, yeah, this is great. This is going to happen. It was perfect. The fertilized donor egg was successfully transferred. And then I had another early miscarriage. And I was just like, okay, I'm just pretty much really done. I don't, I, yeah. What made you want to go on? Okay. So part of it was that I had so much money invested. I could not walk away with nothing. Right. And so that is what kind of made the decision to switch to donor egg a bit easier because I was just like, I'm coming out of this with something. Right. Then I got down to my last try and my last bit of money. Well, since she brought it up, let's talk about the money. It takes a lot of it to raise children. And I don't know about you, but the idea of going into debt before my child even gets here terrifies me. This was starting to feel like a rich woman's game. I actually brought this up to Hera, the first woman I interviewed. Here's my issue. Uh, the money. It is yes. incredibly expensive, right? It so is. what was that like for you? And do you have... Suggestions for women who are I not do. quite? Oh. So uh, there, are, there are a few things you can do. There are some bank or there's some, there some clinics that actually have um, payment options. So payment plans for like IVF cycles. Uh, CNY is a fertility clinic that a lot of women use because their IVF cycles are less expensive than some others. And I know women that actually fly into New York for the treatments just because it's like so much cheaper than wherever they're, wherever they're located. Um, there's also, you can look at what companies have certain fertility benefits. Uh, and I know for one, like, even if you work at Starbucks part-time, they actually will pay for, um, like IVF and fertility benefits. Like it's interesting because a lot of people don't know this and there's women in our group that actually work there for like the time that they're, going through the process and then they're like peace <laughs> i i know that like sounds really controversial but at the same time like if you can stomach being a barista for a time period it could be really beneficial as like a side I hustle know that. wow yeah i um, did not know that 
Anything so, else you got? So yeah, there's also, I know women who will, you know, I think the public school system in Long Island, maybe it is, New York, um, pays for fertility benefits. I know women who like take certain jobs for a certain period of time just so yeah. that they can kind of get through that, right? And you may be like taking a pay cut in one sense, but, you know, you're playing the long game and you're like, all right, right I'm going to take a pay cut here so I get these fertility benefits and then I'm going to, you know, once I have my baby, go back to doing what I was doing uh, before. Well, what do you know? It's good to know that we have options. But let's get back to Aisha. Because with the pressure on her time and money at its highest, she became even more determined to self-diagnose what was going wrong. I kept trying along the way, talking to my doctors about the hemolytic disease of the newborn, that my body attacked my daughter's um, blood cells. And if I had um, embryos created with the same donor that had the same blood type, could this be causing my miscarriages? None of them listened to me. Oh and so... God. When I switched to donor egg, because what did I do? I changed clinics. Mm -hmm. I changed protocol. I got new eggs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's now, everything. in a male-dominated society, nobody thought to look at the sperm. This is the problem. So when it came down to my last money, and it came down to me about to risk it all, I wanted to bet on myself. And so using donor egg and donor embryo is so easy to make the switch. So what I did was I looked back through the donor egg catalog. I found a donor that had my blood type because guess what? The donor that I used before had the same blood type as my daughter. Wow. So I switched to an egg donor that had my blood type. I switched to a new sperm donor that also had my blood type because I'm betting on black and I'm betting on me. And when I went back to do my final cycle, it was my final cycle. I was broke. Mm -hmm. um, it was, if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose because I did not go against my better judgment. Right. And I got one embryo. Oh my God. I was a third recipient for a donor egg and I got two eggs and one embryo. And that's my daughter. Oh my God. I was constantly looking at my money and trying to balance how much I can afford, how, how much further I can go, you know, before I called it quits. And so luckily I didn't have to call it quits without getting a baby, but it was really kind of like looking at my money and pretty much like on a weekly basis, looking right. and making sure, because remember, regardless of what happened, I would either have one baby or two babies and almost six figures in debt, right? That mm, I would still have yeah. to pay down while I'm paying for childcare, while I'm paying mm -hmm. for maternity leave, while I'm mm -hmm. paying for um, what have you. And so it was a real balancing act. I'm in a better position now that mm -hmm. the babies are here and a lot of the debt is behind me, but it is no, um, no measly feat to, you know, try to keep track of all of that. Um, so it was not easy, but I see a light at the end of the tunnel now. 